Hi everyone, and uh, we're in Wexler, Germany today. I'm so excited. Uh, we've got a week here in Wexler, Germany, and if you're not familiar with the history of Wexler, it's where Leica camera is. And I'm sitting here this afternoon, Saturday afternoon, um, in a little cafe, <laughs> drinking beer at one o'clock in the afternoon, which is fun, with Stefan Daniels. And Stefan, uh, you are the director, so your title is pretty big, so I don't want to mess it up, but. Yeah, yeah, it's called Global Director of the Business Unit Photo yes. at Leica Camera. And you've been with Leica since you were probably 15 years old or? 16. 16. Yeah. 16, yeah. So it's yeah. quite a story, and we, we try to get to a point where uh, we can talk more about that, because it's an interesting idea in regards to uh, working your way through a company uh, in an apprentice program. But what we really want to do is talk a little bit about uh, Leica and the history of Leica. We're going to cover a lot in the next few days, which will actually uh, accumulate in a number of videos that uh, we'll be publishing. And we're going to cover uh, cameras, we're going to cover manufacturing, lenses, R&D, and a lot of other things. But what's really interesting, what we had the opportunity to do today, and we're going to do a, a short take on it, is basically the history of Leica. And I think some of you will be really surprised with where things started. So I'm going to kind of turn this over to Stefan, and we're going to start in the 1800s uh, in the optic side of things and then move into when the Leica camera was invented basically in 1914. So actually the, the origin of Leica um, and the history of Leica starts in 1849. 1849. 1849. Um, and there was an optical institute, it was called, uh, founded by Karl Kellner. And his first product was an eyepiece for an astronomical telescope. Uh, that was his first product he was selling. And in the mid-1800s, slowly uh, the optical industry uh, evolved uh, because Karl Kellner founded his optical institute in, in Wetzlar. Yeah. And in the 1870s, a gentleman called Ernst Leitz joined this company and by the 1900s uh, Leitz became uh, the biggest uh, microscope manufacturer in the world. So it's microscopes first? Microscopes first, yeah. So uh, instruments for also medicine, etc. Uh, but mainly microscopes. And I was interesting when you were talking about this earlier, you're saying each microscope was made individually because the parts were custom made on a one on one ty type yeah. of shot before eventually they got into making small batches. By one mechanic, he did one microscope from A to Z, from, from, from the beginning to the, to the end. And it all was handmade and all the parts were matched individually. What Lights started then is to build it up into a more industrialized business uh, so that he didn't make uh, one, um, one mechanic didn't make one microscope, but a, a number of parts, but they were all the same and with very narrow tolerances so that you could build up a, a more um, a high production quality line, yeah. and a production line being, being more efficient. So now we, we turn the century and we get to 1914. Yeah, actually, we go to 1911 because that's, okay. um, that's uh, an important milestone. Uh, because in 1911, a gentleman called Oskar Barnack joined the Lights Company. And he got employed as the director of the prototyping department. Uh, Oskar Barnack was a precision mechanic. He was a, quite an active guy. And his hobby was cinema filming. Uh, he actually built his own uh, movie camera which is still in, in our possession, uh, and we, we have that camera. But Barnack wanted also to take still pictures. And the difficult thing at that time was that uh, still cameras with glass plates were very big, very heavy. A dozen of glass plates did weigh like 20 pounds, and uh, so he couldn't do movies and still pictures at the same time. And then he came up with the idea of using cinema film for still pictures. Um, and if you see a movie camera uh, still today, it's 18 millimeters high, 24 millimeters uh, wide, 
uh, and the film runs vertically. vertically yes. What Banach did, he put it into uh, the horizontal uh, format and doubled Double the, the narrow side uh, to 36 millimeters, 24 by 36, um, which was called later the Leica format. Or even today, if you speak about a full frame digital camera, it goes back to the format um, being invented by Oscar Banach. Wow, you gotta consider, like, it's over 100 plus years ago and we're still using the same size format, even though we've got sensors and various size sensors, still full frame is still yeah. the 35 millimeter That's what you consider the, the, the real thing, yeah. In 1914, what uh, we now call the Urleica uh, was made by Oscar Barnack, but it was still his private hobby. So, and then in the company, the, um, the economy, uh, economic situation was not very good because uh, World War I uh, was passed in uh, 1918. So um, the business at Lights, at the Lights company, was very slow. But Ernst Lights, the owner, looked for new business opportunities and uh, that's why he gave Barnack the order to develop this little camera he had developed for his own into a serial product. And in 1923-24, um, a number of cameras were given to photographers be being tested and all these photographers were not convinced because they were not used to enlarge a small negative to a larger picture because at that time um, you were using glass plates and make contact prints. So they were rather negative. But then in 1924 and slides said, okay, we're going to risk it and it was about lunchtime, so <laughs> we think it's his, great. <laughs> his empty stomach. Uh, so they sit made it the in decision. a boardroom yeah. you know, with everybody, and they're trying to talk all this out, and nobody's really making a decision. And finally, he just puts his hand down and goes, yeah. We're going to risk it. We're going to risk and it. And I'm going uh, to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because he wanted to go up there in House Friedwart where his lunch was waiting for him. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, and, that's, that's, uh, and that just changed the world there. Yeah. And that is the reason why we sit here today. Yeah. 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 I mean, in, in essence, I mean, think about it. You know, 35 millimeter basically became the norm. And it, and it had its yeah. start right there. Yeah. Because so it, it, took, it took another year till 1925. Uh, when the first camera uh, hit the market, uh, exactly at the Leipzig Spring Fair. Um, and from that time on, it was adapted uh, by artists, yeah, uh, by painters, by very progressive artists who um, made photography uh, as, a, as an expression of their, of their art. Yeah. Um, and in the beginning of the 1930s, the photojournalism came up because the print magazines uh, were, were able to print pictures. Uh, so the photojournalism uh, grew uh, thanks to the Leica, and Leica grew thanks to the photojournalism. When we think about some of the most famous pictures made, you know, back in the 30s and 40s, you know, that were made with the Leica camera. I mean, even some of the, you know, Henry Cartier Brinson and some of these other folks. I mean, they did amazing photography with this camera. Um, one of the things, if, if you ever get a chance to visit the Leica gallery and look at some of the Leica books and look at what was actually made uh, with Leica cameras, just a stunning photography that photojournalists were now had a, a product that was small and portable and they could capture the world so different than they could when they had these bigger cameras. Small, portable, but a very decent quality uh, and that was the trick uh, that uh, you could print an, an A4 page uh, out of a 24 by 36 negative. Now you also had to make enlargers because you know now you have a, a film format that's no longer contact printed so you had to invent an enlarger uh, and that is that is maybe the the secret of the success of uh, of the Leica because it was not only a camera it became a system from, from the capturing till uh, the output, till, till the print, or slide projectors introduced in 1926, for example. So you know, that you're actually, as the film, motion picture film got to be reversal film and you could do 
I guess it was Kodachrome actually, almost, or or something along those lines. At Kodachrome that came up, I think, in the mid thirties. Mid thirties, yeah. so it was. And that gave another uh, another uh, driving factor because now we could see the boiling in color, yeah, even. And the, the, it, they also go along with this. The lenses were were necessary, and it's this is part of where I think Leica's legacy really comes into play. Is uh, you know the, the famous small lenses, you know, that sit on. M cameras and so forth that are just so well engineered and, and you have to touch one and operate one to really appreciate it, but more than anything else, to see the image quality that comes out of it. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, okay, the camera comes into play, but uh, where did the lenses start getting so, into play? And you had to manufacture those to, also. To, to be honest, uh, the Leica has not been, or the Ur Leica invented by Barnack, has not been the very first 35 a camera using 35 millimeter film. There were other examples before, but they all failed because the lens quality was not good enough to uh, make a good picture on that small format. Um, but due to the experience in building microscopes and all this precision engineering, um, Lights was able to make very good lenses. And Barnack actually called his, his colleague from the optics department, a gentleman called Max Berick, uh, who designed the first lenses for the Leica. And that uh, is another part of the success story, to have a small camera, but very high resolution lenses. Uh, by the way, you can still use it on the la latest uh, Leica M10. It's just <laughs> screw an adapter, and uh, you can use a 1930 lens on a 2017 camera. That's incredible. So the, you know, the consistency and the uniformity throughout the years of adapting to that camera. Every time I put this in my hands, I'm having fun taking pictures again. That's how, how it should be, yeah. And you, you're completely right, um, shooting on an M is a completely different experience than shooting on an SLR or a mirrorless camera. I would say the secret is the rangefinder because the rangefinder is so different from any other type of viewfinder uh, because you can see what's happening outside the frame. Yeah? Uh, and you can compose an image by just framing it. Yeah? And your style of, of creating an image is a completely different one. Yeah? Yep. You look, you walk the street, you look something, you see the picture, uh, and then you frame it. Yeah? Whereas in, a, in an SLR camera, um, you look through the camera and then you do the image. But um, in an M, it's a, it's a different approach. It is, because actually, you know, I've, 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 this afternoon I've been shooting with the SL and it's got a zoom lens and it makes, you know, somewhat composition nice. I can find somebody and zoom in and out. You actually not only have to figure out the exposure and the f-stop and everything, and, and specifically the focus, but you might actually have to move forward or backwards to compose the, the, the image because we're, we're working with a fixed lens. So it, it's totally a different experience and it's one that every photographer, you know, should master because it does discipline you on working within a frame, working within a lot of the different parameters and actually understanding, you know, the, the aspects of uh, depth of field and f-stop and, uh, and focus. So it's really fun. Kind of think sometimes that Leica is somewhat misunderstood. You know, if you talk to a lot of people today, they might say, you know, it's like as a, a luxury item and it's not really a luxury item, is it? I mean, it's 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 a fine engineered tool, but it's a lot more. Yeah, it's um, um, you know there is a f there is a big difference between luxury and premium. Uh, in luxury, there is no logical uh, relation between production costs and the selling price. Whereas in premium products, there is, and the way our products are engineered, how they are built, how they are assembled. Um, uh, and the, the, the passion and uh, the manpower and uh, the craftsmanship which goes in there uh, will request a certain price level. And um, sometimes it's, it's a bit um, confused then with, with luxury. Yeah? Um, but in certain parts of the world and for certain products as well, uh, of course it's, it's a luxury product due to the highest pri high price positioning. Regardless of where you're at in your career of photography and your likes and so forth, you should stop by a Leica store, stop by 
uh, a photo specialist store. store that has the Leica products. Put it in your hands, put it up to your eye, turn the focusing knob, click the f-stop, and get an idea of that magic. Because it really is, there is something special. I don't know whether it's the SL or the M or any of the other products, when it's in your hand, it feels something special. Of course, this is this is one part of the of the magic, I would say, um, that the products are well made, the surfaces are nice, the clicks, and it's very precisely made, and it makes you feel very comfortable shooting it, and very, um, yeah, you 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 feel familiar with it. Um, but the other point is that we design our products to be easy to use uh, for a photographer who is experienced and uh, we take off, we take out everything which is not necessary. Yeah. Uh, for example, on the M10, we even skipped the video function we had before in the, in the M-Type 240. Um, and people really like it and applaud for it because it is a simple tool uh, and reduced to the essentials. So uh, it has everything you need, but nothing more. One of the things that uh, I think we're going to look at, as we said, touch the camera, feel the camera and everything, but I think when you do that, you'll begin to appreciate what the value of the camera is in two senses. Not only in the craftsmanship and the build, but in what it offers you as a photographer to ultimately get an incredible image. Point. Chris and I were out shooting with this camera early this morning and last night, and as we were kind of chimping away at the back. I was just commenting to him. I said, boy, you, know, you hear so often that there's a look to a camera. I mean, like you take a picture and you look at the image and there's a feel for it. And we were seeing that, you know, uh, the, the blur, the background, just the, the smoothness of all the overall image and everything. You know, that's a value too. And it's all part of what photography really is. And it doesn't feel like it's over sharpened. It just, it's just a beautiful looking picture. And I used to say the same thing on my Leicas with the film. I mean, we just look at the negative and go, God. And it's another tool in your toolbox, but it's an extension of your creativity and it really makes you work for the picture. And what, what you get is incredible. So we're really excited to be here. Stefan and your whole team and everybody that's working with us over the, the next few days, it's appreciated. But also to all our viewers, Stay tuned because we got a lot to offer you. Stefan, thanks for the tour this afternoon and all the information, and there's just so much more to talk about. But we'll be back with more, and I'll see you on the Luminous Landscape.